So I have to admit, I'm like pretty nervous about this because as professors and then agent, like they speak to people in their lives and I spend most of my time in front of a computer in my pajamas. So this is like a completely different environment than my work. Um, but it's actually really comforting to look out on a crowd and see everyone holding the actual thing that I work on. So this is very affirming just to have you guys um, accept this as a gift from us. Um, so like they said, I'm Kate Shelnut. I'm an editor at Christianity Today. And I oversee the hermeneutics blog website, which is what Karen writes for. It's our, or Dr. Pryor, I'm sorry. It's our uh, women's site. We've got perspectives from evangelical women, and it's, it's cultural analysis. And kind of the, the ground block or the core idea on hermeneutics is that you name a topic, and we can give you a Christian angle on that topic. So with that in mind, I thought, if I'm here talking about editing, there's got to be a Christian angle to it. And I'll admit, it didn't come to me very easily. Um, but as is often the case, I learned a lesson from a writer. So it's very apt that the Christian connection I found came actually from the post I published on our site today, which was from a colleague of mine at Christianity Today. Her name's Andy Moody, and she wrote about Christian's role as stewards of language. So I'm going to read from that to start. So she wrote, words are a gift from God, a piece of his created order given to humanity. In the first chapters of Genesis, God assigns Adam's first chore, naming. He immediately engages humanity in creating with language, and this remains central to our calling. Ezekiel is commanded, son of man, eat this scroll and go, speak to the house of Israel. This model becomes ours. We are to be nourished by God's word and then sent out as prophetic witnesses into the world. Christians are fundamentally people of the word, a body formed by Holy Scripture. What we know about our faith, we know by words. Our scriptures were inspired by the Holy Spirit and crafted by God-breathed creativity of men. So as people of the word, I think we're called not just to write and communicate, but to do it well, to do it to our fullest capacity, to the finest, to be models of writing and creating. And so part of that process is editing. And so if at any point in this talk you think, gosh, this is really technical, she seems really anal or detail-oriented, or why should I care about styles or process or all these little details, just think to yourself that this is about doing things the best way we can do them and ultimately come back to this idea that we care about the way we communicate and the way we use language. So I just wanted that to underscore what will maybe be a kind of what editors do type talk. So I also wanted to let you know that I'm a writer myself, I'm a blogger, I'm a journalist, and I've been on both sides of this editor-writer relationship. In fact, several years ago, I was in college. I was like many of you were now, and I had just big dreams of being a writer and making writing my career. And I owe the growth that I've had and the exposure that I've had as a writer to really good editors, to editors that I respected and listened to and I cared about and who gave me opportunities to write. So editors are like a key part in what's going to happen with your writing and where it's going to end up. So as much as you might associate editors with rejection, sad but true, um, since they're the ones that say no to things, or correction, since they're the ones to remind us of our mistakes, um, the role of the editor is far more robust than that. Ultimately, I think the editor gets to serve as a collaborator in the writing process. The editor partners with a writer to shepherd a piece of work into publication. In the best cases, this relationship is truly mutually beneficial. The writer brings to the publication their own expertise, perspective, interest, and voice. Often the writers that I work for, like I mentioned before, they think of things that I could not think of. They write them in a better way than I could write them. They think of things that are just fresh and different and unexpected. And regardless of media or format, so I'm talking as someone who's worked in newspapers and with this magazine and mostly online, 
but I think this would be the same if you're talking about a book or a memoir or an essay. All editors are looking for fresh voices and perspectives. We're looking for something new in our field, and we get excited when we find someone who's doing that, who's saying something new or saying it in a new way. And you have to remember the editor, again, it's not a rejector or a corrector. Like, we are really reading dorks. Like, we are enthusiasts for the, the stuff that we work with, and we're looking for people to follow and to team up with, and we want to see good writers succeed. So that's really at the heart of it all. So I'm sure what a lot of you are thinking is, how do you make a connection with a writer? Karen told a story of how my predecessor reached out to her, and that does happen. Like I said, I read a lot of stuff, and when something strikes me, whether it's from an academic or an expert in the field or someone who's writing on their own, every once in a while I will email someone and say, I think you're doing something interesting, and I want you to try out something for us if you're interested. But, I mean, that's not how we, we can't find everyone who's out there, and clearly people are also pitching us, and I have an inbox full of pitches, and that's where most of the content comes from. So I'm going to talk a little bit about pitches. Um, I get so many pitches a week that are really good from good writers from people who are technically competent, who um, know writing structure, who don't have mistakes. So it's not like I'm just hitting the delete key all the time. So what is it that makes me pass on a lot of these writers? Um, it goes back to, I think, something else that Karen said, that they're not the right fit for our site. That they're writing well, but maybe this isn't um, that fresh perspective that I was looking for. Maybe it's something I've heard before. I liked it, and that's why I published it a few months ago or a year ago. Um, or I've seen it somewhere else. Or on the other hand, um, it, it just doesn't work with what we're doing. So I don't think any editor wants to look at a pitch, again, across media and say, I've read this article before, or I've read this book before. They're not going to be inclined to sign on and move forward if you're not saying something interesting and fresh. So. I want to emphasize this, think about who you are pitching. Be familiar with the kind of work they publish, their past writers, what content they're known for. Because if a writer says, this isn't a good fit for us, it sounds like a line, it sounds like I'm just trying to get you to go away, but it's back to that mutually beneficial thing. It's not a good fit for us, and it's also not a good fit for you. You don't want to be working with an editor who doesn't specialize in the kind of writing you do. It doesn't help you grow as a writer personally, and it doesn't help you meet the right audience. And so there are writers who sometimes have pitched me that it's almost inconceivable, I think, how they thought that a Christian women's blog would be a place for like a man's essay about traveling Europe, and it didn't even have to do with Jesus. So I don't know, I, I, I almost, I don't know how to respond when I'm like, we focus on Christianity and women. Thank you. So it, that's an essay, that's an email that I send a lot. So I feel like you guys probably get a good sense of the site just from what I've said so far. But you're going to want to, any place that you're pitching, you're going to want to know pretty well. You're going to want to know how they've covered topics before and how you offer something new. Um, you need to emphasize what your new, different perspective is, which doesn't mean it has to be a brand new topic. I know there's only so many things that we can write about. You don't have to be wacky. It's more, are you doing something deeper? Are you doing something more nuanced? Are you being counterintuitive? Are you forcing us to think in a different way? Um, those are a lot of questions that I ask myself as an editor when I'm reviewing a pitch. Um, and when you, when, what comes next if an editor takes interest, kind of like what's the next step if you do, if you hit that sweet spot with an editor? Um, they're going to want to say, maybe they'll ask a follow-up question, tell me a little bit more about this idea. Let's see how it could work for us. Or they might say, here's a word count, here's a deadline, I'll hear from you then. Um, and if they do that, pay attention to those things and pay attention to how you pitched it. If you send back a piece that's like, here's a different idea that came to me when writing, an editor won't always be receptive to that. Or if you're going to miss that deadline and it is your first piece with an editor, 
that's also like a, not a good thing at all. Um, so this first bar of getting published initially at a publication, your first time working with an editor, this is going to be the most kind of work you have to do to get in. Um, but it really is, once you're in, I think you're in a little bit more. Um, when Karen pitches me a piece, she doesn't send me a five paragraph essay defending things. At this point, she can send me two sentences and I trust her, I know her style, I know what she's written for us before, and um, I, we don't have to go through a big back and forth for me to, to understand on, on most times. So it really is, and then there's a lot of effort into getting that first piece done, so I'm not trying to, to, um, to try to make that sound like a little thing, but know that this is your first impression and this is the way you're starting what should be an ongoing relationship with an editor. Um, a collaboration that they're going to want to team up with you. Um, and then as far as the actual writing process, um, I'm sure we all do different types of work in different subject matter. So I'm not going to talk very specifically about writing other than to make a brief personal confession about my own writing. Um, I am the kind of writer who loves having written more than the actual act of writing. Um, <laughs> No matter what it is, even if it's like a really special email that I've taken time to do, I like the fact that it is done and I did it more than actually doing it. So, I, I'm, but I'm an editor and I do my diligence. I'm a professional writer. I always go back and read what I've done and I'll find mistakes and I correct them. But every time I reread my own work, again, I'm so happy it's done, I just fall in love with it. I just convince myself, so good. I used all the right words, I used the right structure, I used the right arguments, little turns of phrase just kind of become my favorite little thing. And this makes me a terrible person <laughs> to edit my own work or to accept criticism from other people. And I say this because I think anyone who writes has that in them to some extent, a little bit of that. And um, it's the same feeling that a lot of writers have tried to kind of bring up or put words to, one of them being Stephen King, who wrote a great book on writing, which I just recommend for anyone who wants to, to write, um, especially novels and fiction, which is not my expertise, obviously. But he says, kill your darlings, kill your darlings. Even when it break your, breaks your egocentric little scribbler's heart, kill your darlings. <laughs> Writers engage themselves in a creative pursuit where you fall in love with your words because they are yours. So it makes you a bad editor. It makes you a bad person to say no to those words because they're yours. Um, so even the best writers need editors and the best editors are the ones that recognize how and where those editors need them. It's a very adaptable role that we play. Um, we have to assess a writer's personality, style, and skills. And this often happens like just through email and the person's writing itself. Um, I don't know very many editors who get to sit down one-on-one -on -one in person a lot of times, but it's great when we do. And I'm just meeting Karen for the first time tonight. And I feel like I know her <laughs> because we've had that many emails. But again, um, so the editor, like I said before, it be it's a collaborative process. They are there to support, enhance, and clarify the vision that comes from the writer. An editor is not there to change the voice or personality of a piece. They're not there to make a, dis a different argument, to make you say something else that you never intended to say. They're there to be the ones to understand the writer's core message and make sure it's presented in a clear and compelling way to people who read it. So even as you start to work together with an editor, the ownership of the piece always lies with the writer. We want it to be the writer's voice, the writer's ideas. It's the writer's darling, I guess as Stephen King would say. Um, so each editor will have her own approach and style, and even my approach will differ from writer to writer depending on their strengths um, and their own kind of if, how open they are to change, how much they want to be challenged in their ideas. Um, and, but generally, any piece that, that goes through editing, there's kind of three levels of editing. Um, in something like Hermeneutics, which is an online publication um, and has one editor pretty much, which is me, I do all of these things for Hermeneutics. Um, in a book, I think like three or four people would do them. 
in different stages. And then for the magazine, I might edit, I edit a couple of the columns in the magazine, so I might do that first edit, but then there are people who do some of the proofreading and other stuff. So I'm gonna talk about the three types of editing. The first editing is just a big picture, and they call this a bunch of things. I've never called it this, but I guess these terms are out there, so people do. Content editing, substantive editing, developmental editing. So this is the biggest um, view that you could have on a piece. So these are, this is when an editor will read an entire text and ask, does this make sense? Does the structure work? Does it need to be divided into different sections or chapters? Do the sections and chapters need to be in a different order? Does the piece progress and develop? Is it paced well? Does it have the right tone? Is the argument coherent? What are the implications of this line of thinking? Is there something missing or confusing? Is there a gap in the story or a jump in logic? Do we need more examples? Do we need an anecdote? Does it go on too long? Is it repetitive? Are there contradictions within the text? Thinking this way, an editor will make notes and suggestions for a writer to consider. There are good people at anticipating counter arguments and criticism that might not come to mind immediately for the person who wrote it. This was something Professor Olson came up with when he was talking about working with a group to say, what are the people who disagree with us on this going to say? And to what extent should we acknowledge that or not acknowledge that and know it's just gonna come? Because you never want to be a writer of a piece and think, gosh, I never thought people were gonna think of that. You're gonna wanna think of all of those things ahead of time so that all of your decisions made in terms of the overall argu argument and structure are deliberate. Um, so this is, this is where I do like, even just in Word, I do note function and just <coughs> throw up questions. This is what it sounded like you meant. Is this what you really meant? Especially if it's something that doesn't fit with what that writer has written before or goes against something Christian and maybe they didn't intend that. It was, sometimes it's a word missing, sometimes it's I totally didn't think that sentence was gonna be read like that. Um, and then sometimes it's also like I get excited that a writer brings up a topic and I think, oh, this reminds me of this article or this book or this thinker. And I'll say, have you thought about bringing up this person? And it's never a mandate. It's never you need to quote X person here. You need to make reference to this here. But sometimes they're like, no, I didn't think of that connection. Or they read the article and say, actually, that does make it a little more relevant. And so it's a back and forth, especially in this process where we're really – outlining what the whole point is and how we're gonna present that point. Um, and to me, this is like the most valuable thing an editor can do because technically, I think you could ca catch all your grammar mistakes. It would take a lot, but I don't think that you could anticipate the way other people think, the way other people can. I think you always need another person and sometimes many people to think about how your things are gonna be read. Um, so to move on to the second type of editing, this is called line editing. And in line editing, um, if we've got kind of the structural ideas down, now we're down to like paragraphs and sentences level where we talk about the readability of the text and the flow of the language. Um, this is the time where we would remove unnecessary words, adjust any phrases that are clunky, split up run on sentences, look out for word echoes, which is when if you use the same word a few times in a sentence or in a paragraph, um, flag any double entendres or distracting references. This is where sometimes it can be awkward, especially in a Christian setting, where I might say, did you know what this also happens to mean in the world? But it, you need an editor to have at least a little bit of a dirty mind. It's, you just have to be able to know because I, because think of how bad it would be if I didn't, and it went out there, and people you know, laughed at it or joked it off. So you have to be able to just anticipate these kind of accidental references. Did you know this is a title of a book about X? And it might not even be a dirty thing, but you're kind of making a reference, or this might call to mind something that you didn't want to. Um, so the other things we'll do is condense sentences for impact. and um, So this is kind of just at the sentence level. And then the third type of editing is the very, the most detailed, the most close up, and that's proofreading um, or copy editing. And this is when we're looking for the, the things that you think an editor is supposed to do. Grammar mistakes, um, checking write it, writing for consistency against a style guide. Um, CT has its own style guide. We, use, we also use the Chicago Manual of Style as one. 
um, when I was in newspapers, we used the AP style, and you might think, oh, I'm just writing, I don't need a style guide. But this is the kind of thing, when do you spell out numbers versus use digits? When do you, do you or do you not use the serial comma? Big debate, you guys. So you want to just make sure that there is consistency in your writing. I don't think a lot of times it matters what decision you make either way, but just the fact that you've thought of it and made a decision. So this is where we see in copy editing and proofreading, spelling errors, did, homophones, did you say one word and you really meant the other way of that word, missing words, misspellings, typos, fact checking, did you use the right names of people? Is that really that, the name of that guy's book? Is that really his title? Is he still at that university? Is that university really located in that place? It's just Googling these days, guys. People used to have to like call places and look up things in like farmer's almanacs and all that kind of stuff. So it's almost at this point, there's no excuse for anything that can be found via Google. Like you can, you can verify these things and not have mistakes that embarrass you as writers. Um, capitalization, dangling modifiers, subject verb agreement, um, and then other little style things. I just listed some of the things that come to mind that I look for. Um, so at this point, between the structural editing, the line editing, the copy editing, that's kind of a, a lot of a process to go through, even if you're one editor. And um, just to talk a little bit about my own process with hermeneutics, again, that I'm doing that, that solo, I always read through a piece three times at minimum, like three times if I'm on deadline, like this is something that has to go up quick. Um, and usually it's a lot more than that because we'll have more back and forth. But the reason you do it three times is the first time you don't make any changes. You don't make any marks. You don't fix any mistakes. You read the whole thing through without making changes. It is a challenge, my friends. As someone who <laughs> wants to correct things and is like, no, 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 we're going to do it a different way. And I've done it before, and then I realized by the end, oh, she said that thing at the end, or oh, this happens. But it's really important, to, I think, to, the first time you read a piece through as an editor to keep hands off completely just so you get the full point, the full point of their argument. Because if you're making those little changes, those line edits, those copy edits, at that point, you're not focusing on the structure and the gist of the argument. And I think that's the most important thing to get first. So once you've read it through one time, you can go back the next time, write those questions in the margins of, of structural questions, argument questions, reference questions. You can start adding the commas and deleting the sentences that you think don't belong or doing those kind of arranges. And then you have to read through it a third time to make sure that the edits you made made sense, that you didn't edit out in a paragraph that was necessary or something. So this is like on a news cycle, I would do those three go-throughs. But with, with hermeneutics or things that have a longer time, after that, I'll send it back to the writer. And I always, as I'm, as I'm doing that whole editing process, I try to take notes, usually in an email, of what stuck out to me as like the things I liked about the piece, what was the main point I got from it, um, and then just a summary of the kind of edits I made. Here was my favorite part, my favorite thing you did, or I loved how you used this example. And then I'll say, I made a few changes to the beginning, or I switched the tone of voice they used at the beginning, and then a few copy edits throughout, just so they know what to expect. And if it is a major change, or if I did something kind of huge and shaking, again, I, I'm a writer, I know that writers don't like to be open to a Word doc and be like, what happened to my thing? So I try to anticipate that. Here's, what, here's the kinds of changes I made and why I felt like they were necessary. And I think that most writers, when you explain why something was done, I felt like this was the strongest point and I moved it to the top. And I thought, and then I made some adjustments just to make sure that flowed. And I think that a lot of times they can be receptive to that. And sometimes they'll, they'll give me feedback and say, no, no, I really liked the other piece. And I always want to welcome that voice back as a writer. I don't want to make any changes that make a writer uncomfortable. And I don't want a writer to ever think that when they send me an email, they're like waving goodbye to their work, like that it's just going off somewhere. Um, because I know the feeling, and I think sadly you might feel this at some point as writers, of going to a place and seeing your byline and getting excited and then seeing what you wrote, but not how you last saw it. <laughs> but maybe with a mistake edited in, or maybe with a sentence that you completely didn't intend. And I don't want 
the writers I work with to ever fear that that's going to happen. And I want them to know that they can always talk back to me. Because I'm like, as a writer, we're quirky, we're weird. There's some words that I just would never use in my writing. And if that word is edited in, I'll just say, no, I can't. I don't do that word. And, and editors will work with you on that. They know. So, so that's kind of how it goes through as we read through the changes. And in terms of for online, after we've got a, a copy that we've agreed on, maybe we go back and forth three times or something, and we've, we've got it the way we like. Um, an editor is also the one who does a lot of the formatting and packaging. For online, that means like writing a title and a deck, a headline for the piece, helping choose what image would run with the piece. And then for a site like Hermeneutics, I often think of when in the week it makes sense to run it. Not always like Wednesdays are a great day to talk about motherhood, but like <laughs> it's more like in the mix of what else is running on the site. When would this fit in with our content? And I hate for things on similar topics to compete with one another. I don't think it's fair to either writer to put two pieces up on like something really similar and we also basically split the traffic on that. And then, and then again, the writers each don't get um, as many eyeballs as, as they should. So if someone's just written about a topic, I'll say it's going to be a week or two. We're, we, you know, happy to have your piece. We've got it ready to go, but it's not going to go up on the site yet. So that's another thing that I kind of think about as, editor, as an editor is the broader mix. How does this fit within the rest of the content that I have? Um, so I wanted to talk to you about, because you're probably hearing you're like, well, great. I don't have like an editor in my back pocket, so what am I going to do with this information? One, I hope and pray for each of you that if, if you feel like this is your calling and you want to be a writer, that one day you're going to be working with an editor, you're going to be pitching an editor, and that this will be helpful in like a really practical way, just knowing what an editor is thinking. On the other hand, I again, I don't advocate becoming your own editor full time, but I think you can learn from this mindset. I think that you can be a better writer by editing your own work. Um, so, so here are just like a couple of takeaways that I have. So one of them is if you don't have access to this professional editor, you probably have like a boyfriend, roommate, mother, you know, classmate, someone who might be able to just read over your stuff. You've probably asked someone to read over your stuff before. I just want to advise you to do that and to be careful with how you do it. One, do you really trust this person, not just are they smart and will they know the grammar, but do you trust them to understand what you're saying? Like my mother's a great um, grammar nerd, you know, a great person to find mistakes, but I don't, if I don't think she's going to be into the content that I'm writing about, I can't just send her like a theo theological essay and say, mom, please edit this. You've got to make sure the person's going to be interested enough to know what you're saying and to care that it's said right. Um, and, and just know your expectations and goals for the piece. Are you just looking for general feedback or do you want them to kind of nail down into it? And then again, um, don't like send it to everybody you know. Like don't get like 10 people to edit your stuff because you're gonna get so many different pieces of feedback back that it's, it's gonna be really confusing for you and you're not gonna know where to go. So again, think of who you trust the most to be a helpful voice and editor and who would be interested in doing it with you. I still think that it is a collaboration and it's gotta be someone who's, who's kind of into that. Um, and then when you're, when you're thinking like your own editor, and this is gonna help you in both pitching and going through the writing process and, and fixing your own work, um, think about how you'd pitch or explain an idea to a friend or neighbor this is like a piece of writing advice that I've heard so many times that it feels silly to like repeat it again and again, but I still use it. Like I still think about that. It still helps me know if I have a good idea. If I can think of how I would explain it to another person, a friend, a colleague, if I can think of how I would say the idea of the piece I'm writing about in a few sentences, and I can actually even sometimes speak those sentences out loud, to me that's a good affirmation that that idea can be summarized. If I start stumbling over a word or say, actually, no, really, or kind of correct myself and go back and forth on things, I need to rethink that idea. If you can't say it in a few words to someone, what is this piece about, and you hesitate, it's not ready to be pitched. It's not in a good shape for writing, um, which is fine. but. Just think that's a good way to help. And, then, and that same exercise for me is a good way to know how to start an article. Again, 
you, you heard me say that I'm someone who loves having written more than writing itself. And so when, when I get stuck up on how something starts and I really want to, how do we begin it? I have all these ideas. The first thing I think of is what would be the thing that I would first tell someone about this? What, and that's usually will tell you what's the most interesting or what's a good summary point to start. And who knows, you may edit that out, but just for me as an exercise to get started in writing, I think, how would I speak this to someone? How would I explain this concept to someone? Um, my other big piece of advice is to let yourself learn as you write. I think it's really helpful to outline and structure. I think it's helpful to have a concept in mind as you go. But one of the things I find myself doing the most as an editor is finding a hunk of text at the end where I'm like, this is what you were trying to say. And I move that piece of text to the top. Because the writing as a creative process, as we go through, we work through those ideas and we know more when we finish than when we started. So sometimes it becomes really obvious that you didn't know what you were talking about when you started, which is fine. But you should just be able to to say, okay, now that, I, now that I've done this, now that I've gone through this journey with myself as a writer, be willing to say goodbye to what you had at the beginning at first, or you might have to even say goodbye to concepts that don't fit in anymore now that you've got this more concrete idea and, um, and kind of bring it up and do a different kind of conclusion or, or go from there. Um, another thing is, like we said in the beginning, think of your critics. Think of what people who don't agree with you are going to say. I don't think you always have to acknowledge them. I don't think you have to say the counter argument to this would be this. Sometimes you, you would, but just think about it. And a lot of times, even just having it in your mind, you can write in a way that avoids people accusing you of having a straw man. You can write in a way that even not explicitly um, takes those things into consideration. I think it just makes you a better writer to not assume that everyone who's reading it is gonna be like, on board with whatever vision you've got. Um, and then the last thing is to strive to write clean, to, um, to care about your mistakes and style and grammar and all those little things that get caught in copy editing. And I know it's hard to find those things when you read a piece over and over again and become so familiar with it that you just love it. So the ways that I try to counter that in myself when I'm editing my own work is to read it aloud Honestly, it takes a lot of time, but that's the best way to know if you've skipped a word or if two sentences sound weird next to each other, even though you thought they sounded okay. And the other way, which is like a big proofreading trick, is to read it backwards, word by word. Look at every single word and every single punctuation starting at the end. And then that way, again, when you read something forwards, your eyes glaze over because you anticipate the next word that comes. And that's why even as an editor, there are pieces that have gone up on hermeneutics that have a missing word. And it's because that word was there when I read it, but like when I thought I read it. So, um, so that's that. And I wanted to, those are like the prepared remarks I had. And before I go to questions and other things, um, I really wanna thank you guys for coming and for taking interest and um, being part of this. And as kind of our other reward, besides giving you a magazine redesigned, copy of CT, subscription for five months. I hope that you go to our website, workchristianitytoday.com, christianitytoday.com slash women is hermeneutics. And then another link that you're gonna wanna know and write down is christianitytoday.com backslash go backslash student contest. We are having a writing contest because we want your work on hermeneutics. Um, so I'm hoping we're gonna open the contest to any students at any level, so undergrad, graduate, seminary, whatever you're doing. Um, and I wanna choose one student from Liberty, at least, and maybe one student from another institution. So the, the terms of the contest are there. Um, the deadline's December 13th, and um, keep all these things in mind as you go. So I'll know whether or not you are listening by whether or not you pitch something <laughs> that's good or, or create something that's good and that you've, you've gone through these things. Um, but we can do questions now. I don't know how long I want. Yeah, we can do questions now. Okay, we have a question right over here. So first of all, as someone who does love the Hermeneutics website, thank you for oh, what good. you put together um, and the various writers that you help supervise. 
But I was just curious, can you tell us a little bit about how you got to your current position? Yeah, um, this is a, a nice story because maybe a God thing. Um, I was, it was, they contacted me and asked me to do it. So I didn't even seek out the job, but it's turned out to be the perfect job for me. And then in terms of my own background, I was a religion and journalism double major um, in college, and people used to ask me, well, what are you going to do as a religion and journalism double major? And I felt stupid saying, I think I'm going to write about religion um, because that's like the obvious answer, but that was my actual answer. So I was a religion reporter for a few years and had made connections um, in CT. No, nobody like my best friends, but just people I knew professionally. Um, and I was a active like reporter, blogger type. Um, and hermeneutics is actually a little bit different for me and I don't write for the site as much because I'm not um, one as smart as these ladies are in terms of like theological framework and I, I haven't written as much personal stuff so I'm more on the journalist side um, but I've been inspired and have been like learning and um, have had more opportunities to write that way too yeah a Christian blog that I put out each week and one of my struggles is with promoting it for bylines what do you recommend do you recommend that you come up with like different content or um, kind of copy and paste some of your best lines from your pieces as you're trying to promote that um so are you talking about like promoting it on social media yeah like um you know, you've got your piece and you want people to come to it, so do you usually, like, would you say you should come up with, like, are you struggling with this? Blah, blah, yeah, blah. so I have a few thing, thoughts about that. I also do the social media for um, Christianity Today magazine and for hermeneutics, um, and I have my own little just kind of experimental way of doing things and trying to see what works. I am one of those people who doesn't believe you should necessarily use the title of the blog unless you think that's the best and only way to say it unless it's like super punchy and good and even in that case I think it's nice to do something different um, I would say people like retweeting quotes so sometimes if it's like an inspirational quote or like a really retweetable thing use the quote and the link I will say you have to be careful with that um, because the way that we've seen in traffic um, people will just retweet it and then not click the link they'll think oh that sounds good go ahead um, which is silly, because what if the link was to something that you didn't want to share? Anyway, um, so, so that's one way to do it. And I think it's best to have a variety. I don't think that people should look at your Twitter feed and it should look like an RSS feed, where it's new post, you know, colon, question, or headline, 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 headline. I think it should look, again, relational, conversational, the way a conversation would be. I would do one that's a quote. I would do one um, that pulls out like a specific element that people could grasp onto. I think with Christian content, it's hard because sometimes when we're like, great thing to say about grace or thankfulness, it just seems so vague that people aren't always incentivized to click versus like news headlines where I'm like, Kim Kardashian, I know what that's gonna be about. So if there's like <laughs> a specific example that you use, maybe try to pull out whatever's the most like specific element um, so even if um, there's an article on CT that uses one thing as an opening anecdote, but the whole piece is really about something broader, like the whole piece is about the resurrection, but we talk about how a man from a car accident found God, you know, that's a really specific thing that someone can imagine, okay, here's that. So I would do a quote, something specific, something intriguing and brief. Like, don't use the whole 140 characters so that people can add their own little, this is interesting. And I think when you get those endorsements from people who retweet it with a comment, I think people click those a lot more. So my whole thing would be variety. Don't be afraid to try a bunch of different ways and learn for yourself what gets the most retweets. And I will admit, I pay a lot of attention to social media, and I do it as like a way to, to learn that I think sometimes when I can see what keywords people look for um, and ultimately, I do think it, it, it enriches people to access our content. So if I can frame it in a way that makes people want to access it, I will use those techniques. I hope that helps. A, a comment and then a couple of questions. Oh, sure. 
I tend to only read hermeneutics when Karen is writing in it. <laughs> One thing I'll put in a plug for is Google Alerts. If you go to www.google.com forward slash alerts, you can put in quotation marks something that you'd like whenever it comes up on the mm -hmm. web to get an email every day. And so whenever she writes an article, she's one of the names. I have about 50 or 60 different things of different places that I get alerts for. So that's, that's just yeah. a, a helpful tip for coming up with things. So two questions about hermeneutics is, do you have male writers and does that make a difference is whether you're gonna accept or not accept by whether it's a male or female writer? And then does Christianity Today take any position on the complementarian versus egalitarian or you have writers on both sides? Sure. Um, so yes, we do. We don't have any regular male writers. Um, the kind of stock answer to that is where's the male version of hermeneutics? Um, you can look at CC Magazine over the past 60 years. Um, <laughs> it's kind of a joke, but that's, that's kind of where hermeneutics has come out of. Um, we don't have any regular male writers, but we have had men write for the site. We think that men sometimes offer valuable perspectives, but they often relate to the issue of gender or it's something where a man's perspective, um, where it makes sense for a man to be writing about this. Something that maybe a woman, um, that they hold a, a perspective that a woman wouldn't have looked at it that way or something different. So we've had um, a few in the past, uh, in the past um, year. And then I, I'm trying to think. Um, in terms of people pitching me, a lot of people who pitch us are women. Um, and then sometimes if it, a man is pitching us, I'll point him to, we do have other publications. And again, it's about that, um, it's about that mutually beneficial relationship. Here's the, the real truth. If I were to just, man pitches a, a thing, and um, I were to say, okay, sure, let's do this. I don't think it's always fair to the man unless it's clear why his perspective is there. Um, to put him in the hermeneutics context when um, it's not what our readers expect, and it risks that it puts that person at risk of getting nasty comments from people. Not that our readers are mean people, but I think they would question what was happening there, and I wouldn't just invite them into that that um, area without letting them know that. So we had a man. Um, a great writer who wrote about modesty over the summer. And even in that case where we did say, we've been talking about modesty a lot at hermeneutics, we think it would be valuable to have a man's perspective on modesty because we've had so much of us and, and there have been different things said by men, so we're gonna let this happen. And, and we've welcomed, um, we actually had two men write about it because I didn't want a single one guy as like the man's perspective. And, um, but when that happened, I said, you know, there are gonna be some people who don't like that you're there. And it's, I think that's my editorial duty as the curator of that blog to let people know the expectations. Just the same way that I would say to Karen or any of the women writers, the people who disagree with you are gonna say blank. You've gotta be ready for that. Or you know, how are we gonna readjust or work that? And so that's, I think, one of the things I do for, for as an editor is to make sure the writers go in with the right expectations and that I'm not putting them in a hostile audience environment. Um, there have been writers, like in a similar vein, who have um, ha uh, who have concluded at the end of a piece something that's not really orthodox Christianity, something that I know our writers wouldn't be down with in a theological sense. And I say, listen, thank you for writing this piece. Thank you for working on it. It would be unfair for you, for me to publish this, only to have everyone in the comments tell you that they <coughs> disagree very strongly with the conclusions that you've made. Not that we shouldn't challenge, but when it's completely outside of like our wheelhouse, that makes sense. Um, Christianity Today and hermeneutics do not come down on the complementarian, egalitarian um, debate, divide, perspectives, theological positions, whatever um, those words are. And it's funny um, because people don't even know what that means outside of Christianity, the fact that it means so much to us when we talk about Christianity and gender. Um, but we actually strive to, um, to represent women from both sides, and we do have regular writers as well as guest writers who identify with both of those positions or who lean to both of those positions um, explicitly and not explicitly. Yeah, and, and pe that's what I mean, and, and people who don't care about uh, those, t lames, those names. <laughs>